Welcome to the Live Big Podcast, where real estate expert Nick Paynes shows you that everyone can build wealth through real estate investing. Nick and his featured guests will give you the tools, resources, and expert information you need to leverage real estate into a wealth building strategy. So you can stop worrying about your nine to five and start to live big. Here's Nick with today's episode. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Live Big Podcast. Um, I'm excited to uh, to do this podcast today. Um, I've been meaning to do this one for a while, and um, it's actually going to be a for those of you who watch this on YouTube. Um, it's a screen share, and so if you do have an opportunity to to watch this instead of listen to it, um, I've got a resource guide uh, up that I'll be going through uh, for this for this podcast. So this is actually the free resource guide that uh, I give out on my website about uh, basically how to manage your own rental properties. And so um, even if you're listening to this and you at some point want to go back, download that resource guide off of our off of our website, you can do that and then just listen to this as you kind of follow along through it if you'd like. But um, this is just some of the information that you'll get in this investment guide. Um, it's uh, It's probably about a 30, I think it's about a 37 page document. Um, it's a PDF that you can download. We have physical hard copies of it too, but, uh, um, uh, basically it's the meta homes investment experience and, uh, teaches you a little bit about what to do once you get it, once you get your, your rental property and, uh, what you should expect to, to, to do to get it rented and things like that. So, um, so I'm going to kind of go through it today and, uh, um, just go through kind of page by page and talk a little bit about, uh, Talk a little bit about what we do. So the book itself is written in order. Um, so we start from everything from preparing your rental down to getting a lease signed and then how to handle tenants once they're in, that type of stuff. So we'll start from the very beginning, which is uh, preparing your rental. And the big piece, the, the big kind of takeaway for the, for the rental prep is going to be um, that first impressions are everything. So make sure your rental listing looks good when it's online. So you should, first of all, hire professionals to clean the home and, and hire another set of professionals to take photos. So these are kind of small extra costs, but they're going to return multiple times over um, when it's time to kind of market the property, right? So um, the other thing is, once you take those photos, you can use them over and over again. So if you're turning over tenants, like over and over again, you can turn these photos over and just and just keep using them, right? So it's a small expense. Um, I in in here I've listed a couple of the resources that we use, but you know pictures don't have to be more than a hundred to to two hundred bucks to get pictures for it. And and the reality is they're going to make it look so much nicer than you going around and doing you know cell phone pictures or or whatever. Um, and and maybe if it's staged, uh, even better, right? So um, I don't know that I would. I would uh, incorporate the cost of staging into one of my rental properties. It's really expensive to stage properties, anywhere between eighteen hundred and twenty five hundred dollars uh, to stage a property. So I don't know that I would quite do that, uh, but just get some get some good photos. All right. So um, when you market your property, the good marketing is kind of what brings your good renters. So um, I use a couple of different websites to market the properties. The first one I use is called Turbo Tenant. Uh, this is a great, Turbo Tenant is kind of an all-inclusive uh, landlord website. You can have your leases on there. They have like a DocuSign account that you can use. You can actually even uh, collect rent through the website. And it's free for landlords. So the way that they make their money is A, through advertising, and then B, they have a... Um, um they take application fees so that you don't have to. So your tenants, when they apply through TurboTenant, they'll pay application fees. Uh, and then I think they have some other little, you know, add-ons that you can do there. But for the most part, I've used them for probably coming up on 10 years now, and I've never paid anything for it. So they handle from a marketing standpoint they handle the syndication of the uh of the listing so when you put it on turbo tenant it's going to get kicked out to like 60 different websites uh that do that do rentals right so um, there's a few websites that it doesn't syndicate to so one of them is zillow and zillow's affiliate so zillow trulia.com um, hot pads, and I believe there's one more, but I, I can't think of what it is right now. Um, Zillow charges, I think actually your first property is free on Zillow. If you end up having multiple properties, you pay $9.99 a week to list the rental. Um, 
totally worth it. Uh, it is the number one trafficked real estate website on the planet. So you should pay the 10 bucks um, and, and get it out there. Turbo Tenant will also give you HTML code to post your listing on Craigslist. Um, and that's another additional, that's another you know free option that you can use, right? So anyway, don't cheap out on marketing. Uh, Pay ten bucks to to put it up on Zillow. Uh, you got to remember, if you've got a rental that's three thousand dollars a month, that's a hundred dollars a day that you lose for every day it's not rented. So to pay nine ninety nine for a week of marketing on the number one traffic website, uh, it's totally worth it. Okay. All right. So uh, when we're when we're marketing the property, we want to make sure that we're marketing a proper rent rate, right? So we want to be competitive um, so that you get to choose your tenant, right? What you don't want to be is you don't want to be the top you know, priced rental in the market where you're kind of getting the leftovers, anybody that didn't get accepted by all the other great rentals that were there. And they're coming to you as like a last resort, right? Um, that's where, and, and you're only going to get one option there. That's the only person that's coming to you. And now you got to decide, like, you got to be like, all right, I guess, you know, this is my only applicant. I'm, I'm taking them. Um, I want to have three, four, five, six applicants see people that are very serious about the property so that I can choose my tenant. I can go through each and every one of their applications and determine who I think is the best fit for the property. So um, when we're setting the rate, we use a combination of tools, including we, we use a, a uh, a website called Rentometer. Uh, we use Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, and Zillow to find comparable rentals um, and try to set our rent rate accordingly. So the nice thing about Rentometer is it gives you a historical analysis of rents in the area, usually over the past year, and it maps them out for you so you can see exactly what was seen and where it was and how much it was, right? And so um, you know, again, we want to be able to handpick that tenant. So remember, if you set your price too high, um, and and rents are a little bit different than than purchase price. If you're a hundred dollars high on rent, you may hear crickets, right? And so, you know, let's say for example, you're at twenty one hundred dollars per month when it should be more like two thousand. You gotta remember, you're gonna lose seventy dollars a day for every day it's not rented. So that means in less than three weeks of not being rented, you have lost the entire extra amount of rent that you would have made in an, in a full year if you would have just listed it at $2,000 in the first place, right? So that extra that extra $100 is only gonna be $1,200 over a year, okay? It takes you three weeks to lose that by being overpriced at $70 a day, right? So vacancy will always lose you more money than a fair market rate. So price accordingly, right? Don't try to get more money. Don't try to think like, oh, my property is a lot nicer. Like there are extenuating circumstances. I have a couple of properties that are like really nice um, and I get premium rent rates for those, but you've got to know that you can you can be able to you know get that and not, not have vacancy because at those premium rent rates, you know, $3,000, $3,500 per month, $4,000 per month, every day of vacancy is very expensive, right? All right. So um, when you're showing, this is the number one thing I hope I can teach you when you're showing a property um, that will save you time and stress and frustration, all the things that I went through when I first started doing this. Um, when you're scheduling a property for showing, be mindful of your own schedule, okay? Put a lockbox on the property so that you can easily call someone to help and show if you need be. Um, you know, maybe your real estate agent will help you do that. Maybe they have a team, somebody will help show it for you. Um, we do that for, for for our clients. If they need it, we'll we'll hop over there if we can, okay? Or you might just be out for a showing, um, while, you know, or you might be out and about and instead of thinking, oh, I gotta go home and get the keys, it's already there. You can go just show up, you know, out of the blue. But in general, I recommend showing properties open house style. OK, so you're going to get a lot of no shows. You're going to get a lot of people that tell you they want to rent the place and they want to go see it. And then you're going to drive 20 minutes to it um, to show them the property at, at six o'clock at night, miss dinner with your family. And then they're not going to show up and you're going to be so frustrated and angry at them, angry at yourself. Like, just don't do it. So you're going to get a lot of no shows and there's going to be people that waste your time. So what I do is I set up like one or two open houses and I set them a couple weeks in advance. Okay. Um, and I tell all interested parties that I'll be there between 11 and two on Saturday. 
Okay. And I don't allow for any overlapping showing. So I set 15 minute windows for people to, to see the property. Usually I use um, some type of online resource like a sign up genius, for example, um, to allow people to go on and actually pick out, you know, a 15 minute window that they can use uh, to come in and see the uh, come in and see the property. So um, this is kind of like an interview process, right? So when people come in, you want to use this time to help judge people's character and figure out if, you know, people lied on their application because you can see it all the time. Uh, people out, fill out applications that say they don't smoke, but when you meet them at the property, they smell like smoke or like you can see a pack of cigarettes in their pocket. Um, it. The only other thing I would tell you is if someone really wants the property but can't make it at the open house, they will make a very strong effort to schedule at a different time. Um, and if they're qualified, I would accommodate that request because somebody who really, really wants the property um, they, there's generally a reason that they that they want it. So they you're not just to fill in the spot. It's they they really truly are in love with the property and it's going to be a great fit for them. So you know make make those adjustments um, and and try to accommodate that if you run into to someone who seems really like a great fit. Okay. All right. Um, the lease. So remember that you have a legally binding document. OK. And and so you should really know what you're agreeing to and promising. So it's really important that you go through the Colorado or whatever your local state is. It's really important that you go through the lease and understand what you can and can't do. Um, and you really should review your lease with a with a real estate attorney. OK. Or have it written by a real estate attorney or find a resource that gets it from a real estate attorney. OK. Um, so. Uh, rental rules can change and rental laws can change every year. So in the last couple of years in Colorado, we've had restrictions on the amount that you can charge for late fees. We've had uh, restrictions on when you can charge a late fee. Uh, it used to be five days. Now you have to wait seven days. Um, there's all kinds of things about how many people you're allowed to have in the house or if you're allowed to limit it. There's all kinds of rules about uh, pets and service dogs and uh, um, emotional support animals and all kinds of things. So you need to be really careful of that because you don't want to be violating law when you have somebody sign a lease. More importantly, there are provisions in leases that if you if they're written incorrectly, it'll void the entire thing, right? So like, for example, in Colorado, if you have the wrong um, late fee policy in there, even if you implement, even if you enforce the current law, so you wait seven days to enforce it, the provision in the contract because it's, or the provision in the lease because it's been written incorrectly, it's voided all together and no late fees can apply, right? So you gotta be really careful to make sure that you know you have a proper lease and that you're enforcing it properly, right? All right, negotiating lease. So um, don't fall into the trap of a long hold landlord, okay? This is not generally what happens when you negotiate the first year, it's the subsequent years after that when you're re-upping your lease, right? So always leave yourself the ability to renegotiate the lease. So. First of all, a lot of places won't do anything less than a one year lease, um, but you can make a lot of money on a six month or a three month lease. You can overcome, you know, the turnover period sometimes. I mean, I do stuff where, you know, a, a three month lease, but I'll do a hundred percent increase in, in rent for that time and, and I'll be able to get it. Um, I'll also do something like, hey, you, you know, I'll do a minimum of three months. Um, but if you move out, you know, if you move out before those three months or if you move out before six months, I'm keeping your deposit uh, because I have to turn the property over again. And many people will agree to that. OK, so um, you you also want to negotiate. You you know, some people want to negotiate a better rent rate for someone who wants to sign a multi-year lease. OK, but this is what I, I think this is where people fall into the long hold landlord trap. OK, so. I've seen properties that are severely under market rent. And when you ask them why, like, hey, you know, you should be at 2,500 and you're charging 1,500 a month, like what happened? They'll say, well, you know, the, the tenants, they, they're such good tenants and they've been there for 10 years. And, you know, I don't want to rock the boat because I don't want them to move out. And the the problem is, is like they're losing $12,000 a year on that property. So, you know, have them move out. And the reality is when people people have this expectation, right? And this expectation is if they're paying $1,500 a month, they also don't want to rock the boat with the landlord. So what do they do when something breaks, when something goes wrong in the house? They don't tell the landlord. They don't fix it, okay? They don't call to get it fixed because they're like, man, if, if he fixes it, he might increase our rent. So what happens when those people finally move out? 
you've got a property that's just been completely just degraded and and is just beyond repair uh, when they move out. And and all they lose is their you know fifteen hundred dollars security deposit, right? So keeping up the rents, okay. We're also going to encourage. Hey, by the way, we're gonna we're gonna renew your lease. It's gonna go up two hundred dollars. By the way, while I've got you, is there anything in the home that needs to be addressed right now? Like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna up the rent, but we're gonna take care of it. And, you know, take care of the place and make sure it's good, right? So um, I will tell people give incentive for multiple years leases, um, but you know, don't lock them in for five years or something like that. So I always implement yearly increases, even if they're you know doing a multiple year lease. So if it's like a two year lease, I'll say, hey, in year one your rent's going to be this. In year two, you're going to have a two percent or a three percent increase. And that way, in ten years, even you know if you've gotten at least some type of increase, twenty five bucks a month, fifty bucks a month um, over ten years. You're not going to be at 1500 anymore. You're going to be at 2000. You know, you're going to be at 1750, whatever it may be. Um, but you're going to have some type of, you're going to have something to show for those, those years. All right. So I think the biggest thing to remember with this is that investing in real estate is a business and you're not in the business to lose money or to do favors, right? You're in the business to make money. And, and like people want to vilify landlords, but I want you to think about it this way. Like if you sold gasoline, Okay, if you rent a gas station, would you still sell gasoline for 50 cents a gallon to someone just because they started coming to your coming to fill up gas at your place 70, you know, in 1970, 1980? No, you you have to increase the prices just because somebody's been loyal or coming, you it's still a business, right? So don't fall into that landlord trap. It's huge and it will it, it hurts you in so many different ways. It's diff, it's really difficult to offload the property while there's a tenant in place that's uh, that is severely under rented. Um, and then, like I said, they're just not going to take care of the property because they don't want to rock the boat either. All right. So um, another another screen on on multi year leases. Um, I always tell you tell people reach out to your tenants 60 days in advance to find out if they're going to be renewing their lease. Okay, be upfront about any changes to their lease, any rent increases. Um, and uh, I, I think you know if you've got a great tenant in there, increase rent, but do like three percent, three percent annually. Okay, it's not enough of an increase to make somebody move, but it's not so little that you'll be significantly behind market rent over the years. Okay, so when you're writing multiple year leases, I think you still write in a rent increase for that second or that third year. Don't just give them, you know, oh, it's two years at this rate. Okay. All right. Um, any additional addenda, right? So if you have any particular things with that property that you need to talk about, um, you need to make sure they have it. First, a big one um, is if your home was built prior to 1978 you must provide your tenant with a lead-based paint disclosure as well as a pamphlet from the EPA um, that's entitled Protect Your Family from Lead-Based Paint in the Home. Okay, So like these are things that you need to know. You can't just go out and rent a house. Like You need to have the legal wherewithal to understand what you're doing when you're running this business, right? So um, another example that you might have would be like, um, I would disclose if you had lack of egress in a bedroom, right? So if you had a non-conforming bedroom in the basement, for example, where there was no egress window, I would probably put in the additional provision of the of the contract that says, um, you know, uh, the tenant understands that the, the bedroom located in the basement is non-conforming and pos poses a potential safety hazard as the occupant would lack an easy escape uh, during an emergency due to the absence of egress windows. Landlord recommends that these rooms be used as flex spaces only and not bedrooms to avoid any potential safety concerns. So putting something like that in there gives you a little bit more like, hey, we told them not to use those basement bedrooms as, you know, or be basement uh, rooms as bedrooms in the event that something happens. Like do what you can to protect yourself up front, all right? All right, a couple things about pets and pet rent. Um, so you need to decide, first of all, if you're gonna allow pets in your property, okay? Um, we've talked about this, I think before, about how these can be value adds in, in real estate. You know, you can get an extra 50 bucks a month. Um, uh, you know, you can get an extra security deposit, that type of stuff. But uh, people love their pets and they're gonna do anything they can to, to make sure they have them with them. So, um, but even with the most well-behaved pets, there's gonna be in, there's gonna be damage, there's gonna be wear and tear. So. You know, be sure to charge applicable pet rent, um, refundable, non-refundable pet deposits. Um, the pet rent that you charge should be determined by the type of pet. Um, so I have some recommendations on it. However, this changes like city by city, county by county, state by state. So um, there, you know, 
in my rentals, I generally charge 50 bucks a month for a pet. Um, and I have a $250 non-refundable pet deposit. Uh, I think Denver, for example, just passed a law where you can no longer have non-refundable pet deposits. And uh, I think the other piece is uh, they limited the amount that you can charge per month. And I don't think it's 50. I think it's uh, something like 3% of 3% or maybe it's even 1% or 2% of, of base rents um, or $30 or something like that, whichever is more or less. I, I can't exactly remember, but know your know your local rules in, in each area. Okay. All right. A um, couple of things about uh, how you're accepting payment. Your tenant moves in. How are you? How are you doing payment? Right. So, first of all, it's a, it's really important to set a precedent with your clients that it's their job to pay rent and not your job to collect it. Okay. So, um, companies like Turbo Tenant offer invoice servicing programs. So, like you can set it up to invoice the client every month for a certain you know for the certain amount um, on a certain date so that they get an invoice. I think that's a great piece of software. You can do that through QuickBooks. There's all kinds of stuff that you can do to invoice automatically. Um, but again, it shouldn't be your responsibility to remind your people to to hold uh, to pay rent. So hold your accounts clients accountable for the rent payments. Um, charge a late fee. Um, this again gets changed. So this uh, this actually needs to be changed in Colorado. Um, we can charge a five percent late fee on day one that it's late, but now it's not on the fifth of every month anymore. It's now on the seventh. So um, we used to be able to charge a daily late fee, uh, but now we can only charge one late fee up to 5% of rent. But um, that may actually hurt people more than, than, than help them because I used to charge 25 or $30 a day. Um, so if they were two days late, they'd owe me 50 bucks in late fees. Um, now the day they're late, it's automatically 5% of rent, which, you know, on a $2,500, uh, you know, rent payment is 125 bucks. So if you're one day late, it's $125, right? So if, if people are going to implement these new rules, we're going to, we're going to enforce them. So make sure that, uh, you know what your late fees are. Okay. Um, the, you know, the idea behind late fees is that we're not trying to make extra money. It's, that we're trying to discourage the late payment, right? So, and you can use it as a negotiating tool. So when you're just trying to get your client to pay something. So, you know, I put an example in here, you know, say something like, I've under, I understand that you're having a hard time paying rent this month, but I have a mortgage to pay on this property as well. If you can get me the payment by the 10th, I'll waive half your late fees, right? So give them some incentive. Uh, it's also good to accrue the late fees in the event that they might take, you have to take a client to court. So, um, you know, keep track of all the late fees, even that you've waived or that, that were accrued. Okay. Um, and then be understanding with your tenants, right? If they're having trouble paying rent, set up a good faith payment plan. And I would say, get what you can when you can. Um, cause somebody that starts falling behind on rent, there's a good chance that they're just, there's going to be a point where they just stop paying. And so, Get what you can when you can. Ask the tenant, what can you pay for rent right now? And, and work them as much as possible. So they, you know, they're in one of your most valuable assets, right? So, so work with them and you know, try not to create an angry tenant. Okay. Um, accept forms of payment that are easy for you, not necessarily the client. So um, I do Venmo, PayPal, Zelle. They can do a direct deposit to my bank account. Um, I don't accept check or cash. Um, checks, not as bad anymore because we have direct deposit, but like cash, I don't, don't want to have to go to the bank. So if somebody wants to set me up on a bill pay and mail me a check every month, uh, that's, that's fine too. Now that we have direct deposit, but prior I did not allow for checks. All right. Um, security deposits. So, um, know your laws on security deposits, unlawful retention of security deposits can result in a judgment, at least here in Colorado, um, three times the amount of the, the deposit, right? So always collect your security deposit up front, review your lease carefully. So you know what reasons you can hold back a deposit and your deposit should be returned to your tenant generally within 30 to 60 days. Again, depending on, um, uh, depending on your, your state. So um, I would highly suggest avoid telling a tenant that you're going to be withholding from their security deposit prior to their departure from the property. So if you tell a tenant that you're keeping their deposit, um, they're not going to 
that, you know, upon move out, they're not going to clean the house. They're not going to fix any, any things that they did, in, you know, to the, to the property. If they think they're already losing their deposit. They're not going to do anything to make, make the property any better. Right. So just make sure you go in, you carefully document what you're withholding for, take pictures, let the client cl- know clearly why you're withholding. Um, anytime I have a person move in or out, we go through and do a video walkthrough of the property. And I, put that in like a Dropbox or I put it in a, in a Google Drive folder. And I tell people when they move into the property, you personally take a video of the property and hang on to it so that if I come in and say, hey, you damaged this and you say that you didn't, that it was there, pull out your video, show me I'm wrong and I'm happy to remove it, right? So just make sure uh, you don't get caught for unlawful retention of a security deposit. All right, insurance. Your tenant's insurance policy should cover you as well. Okay, so inform your insurance company. And first of all, insure, inform your insurance company that you're a landlord of the property and you won't be living there. So then your policy is going to generally be slightly less expensive because it won't cover any personal property. It'll just cover exterior um, and like hazard damage. Okay. And then make sure that the that the tenant gives you a copy of their renter's insurance policy and make sure I would require them to add you as an additional named insured, okay? So additional named insured is a person um, or a business that is named somewhere else in the policy, okay? So they you will be listed on that, that you can get paid out in the event that they do something to damage your property, okay? They've gotta have renter's insurance. Don't let them move in without renter's insurance, okay? All right, planning for expenses and home warranties. So uh, I keep home warranties on my properties at all times. We give a couple of recommendations here. I've used uh, American Home Shield, First American Home Warranty, two to 10 warranties. I've used Blue Ribbon before. I don't recommend them though because I I didn't think they were great. So, um, but it's really important to plan ahead for for kind of the maintenance and repairs. And I suggest putting anywhere between 10% of gross monthly rent or 1% of the home's current market value every year. So if you've got a $400,000 home that rents for 2,000 a month, you should be saving somewhere between $2,400 and $4,000 a year for expenses. You're generally not gonna spend that. Like on a yearly basis, you you know, you know might spend, a, well, your warranty is gonna be 500 bucks and maybe you have a couple of service calls. You're probably gonna spend less than $1,000. But, you know, you hold the property long enough, you're going to end up doing some big things, maybe a kitchen remodel, a bath remodel, windows, roof, new flooring, that type of stuff. Okay, so use the warranties. Um, It makes it really nice when a big thing goes out, AC, furnace, water heater, you're not coming out of pocket with three or four thousand dollars. You're, you know, paying a seventy five dollar service call and getting it taken care of. Um, Also, you let your tenant know, hey, anything, anytime something goes wrong, let me know. I have a warranty on the property. I'll immediately set, you know, send over a ticket. Okay. All right. Um, utilities. Uh, so make sure that you set up landlord accounts for all your utilities. So if the tenant's going to be responsible, the utilities need to be set to be transferred into the tenant's name when you when you hand over the keys. But you're going to stay on the landlord account um, as the owner. And what will happen is the the uh, um, utility companies will let you know if the tenant stops paying or if they have a past due balance, that type of stuff. So water and sewer are lien items against the property. So this means that uh, if the water bill goes unpaid, the water company can put a lien on your house. So you got to make sure that the water bill is being paid. Okay. Um, they're also going to revert back to you when the tenant leaves so you don't have gaps in billing. Okay. So make sure to set up landlord tenant accounts. Um, okay. Tenant just is finally moving in. Okay. So you're not getting keys without money. Okay. So I'm getting my first month's rent and I'm getting my deposit as a minimum before you get keys. Okay. So do not under any circumstance give access to the property without money. Okay. Because um, even if they say, Oh, I'll move in today. I'll get you the money tomorrow. The second they get in there, the only way to get them out is an eviction and an eviction is going to take you depending on where you are, a month, two months, three months, okay? And you have zero money to show for it. So, and and literally the second they have those keys and they go into that property, the way to get them out is eviction. If they don't have keys, you don't have to evict them, okay? So um, make sure you walk the property with the tenant or like I said, have them carefully document with a video or you carefully document with a video um, and pictures. And then once you've completed the walkthrough, show the tenant some of the important items. So how to work the thermostat, the sprinkler system, the appliances, Um, always show them the location of the main water shutoff valve. Okay. If they come home to a flooded house, they need to know how to turn the water off. So that doesn't, you know, doesn't get worse. 
Okay. And uh, again, verify your renter's insurance. Okay. Give them their keys, their garage door openers, that type of stuff. All right. Property inspections. So mid-lease uh, property inspections are something that I recommend in order to hold your count, uh, your tenants accountable. So plan to check in quarterly. Um, you can evaluate, you know, whether you believe more frequent inspections are necessary. So, you know, you're checking for cleanliness of the property, damage the property, upkeep of the grounds, um, any violations, extra people living in the property, undocumented pets, smoking, drug usage, anything that would violate their leases. OK, um, and always ask the tenants if there's any issues that need to be taken care of and, and take care of them immediately. OK, um, you need to determine what routine maintenance will be the responsibility of the tenant and which items you will take care of, right? I think it's unreasonable, for example, um, this is just my opinion, for a landlord to tell a tenant that they have to keep the trees trimmed back from the roof. I don't expect my tenants to get back and get up on 20 foot ladders and keep the trees trimmed. I just want them to let me know if they start hitting the roof and scraping the, you know, scraping the roof. Um, I do expect them to pull weeds, right? So there's some things I think you can expect. There's other things I think that, uh, you know, you should, you should take care of, all right? Uh, tenant incentives, give your tenant another reason to pay on time. Uh, there's a few nice uh, tenant incentives you can offer. Um, so a lot of times people are renting because they don't have credit repair. Um, you can offer something like Rental Karma. Um, they're rent reporters that report on-time rent payments to the credit bureau that help them boost their credit score. Um, the, the tenant usually pays for this service. It's it's usually cheap, like five to 10 bucks a month. Um, but, you know, you can agree like, hey, I'm happy to report your stuff. If you want to do this, I'll report it so I can build your credit. Um, you know, another thing might be to include monthly cleaning or you can do fall lawn cleanup or um, even, you know, weekly lawn services. So not only do the incentives keep your tenant happy, but they're going to keep your property nice as well. So think about maybe offering a service as an added bonus if you've got the room to do it in your, you know, in your budget. Um, all right. So now you've got a tenant in the property and now you've got a non-compliant tenant. So um, we've already talked about avoiding talking about the deposit until the tenant has vacated. Um, but, uh, you know, it, this is why it's so important to make sure that you're evaluating your tenants for character, for good character. Um, I really think it's that that's like the most important thing. And that's why I like to self-manage um, because, you know, we can just Sometimes we just get a good feel, right? So uh, if a property, for example, if a tenant doesn't take care of a, a landscaping on the property, um, give them the option to hire someone and take care of it or for you to hire someone and add it to their rent, okay? If they refuse, you need to do what's best to protect your property. So spend the money to maintain the landscaping. And if the tenant doesn't want to pay you for it, I wouldn't argue it. Um, keep a log of that cost and maintenance. And when they vacate the property, you have the possibility of withholding the amount accrued from their deposit. And if it, if it, becomes more than the deposit, then you can go after them and sue them for more. But, um, you know, negative confrontation with your clients, you want to you want to avoid that at all costs. You know, um, if your tenant asks you if you're withholding from their deposit, I try not to have that conversation until the tenant's actually vacated. I'm, I'll say, well, we'll have to see what the condition of the, of the property is when you move out. And then we can have that conversation then. But I want all their stuff moved out and we're at the walkthrough or they've already gone somewhere before we have that conversation. All right. Um, late payments. We've talked a little bit about this before, but, uh, um, you know, give them time. If they don't pay, um, you need to deliver what's called a pay or quit notice. Um, and usually it depends on your area. Um, you know, I think ours now is a, is a, it's either a seven day or a 10 day quit pay or quit notice. Um, but you have to deliver something like that before you can start the eviction process. So even if they, if they're like one day late, two days late, um, and you're trying to get a hold of them and they don't answer you, I would deliver a pair of quit notice right away so you can start the clock, okay? Um, eviction, this is obviously your last resort uh, in the event that a tenant breaks the lease by disobeying any of the rules, non-payment, you might have to evict, okay? So this is called a notice for termination with cause. Uh, it's the legal process of removing somebody from the property and the only people that can enforce a, an eviction is local law enforcement and it has to be with a court order. So you cannot go over and change locks. You cannot uh, go over and start removing personal property from the, from, from the area. And that's why I said it's so important not to let them have access to the property until you have some money in your hands. So, um, so the, the tenant, you know, once they, they get evicted, they're going to have time to cure. Um, and, uh, but the eviction process can be, uh, can be a, a time consuming process. And that's why we want to try to 
stay away from that as much as possible. Um, and really, you should just consult an attorney if you get in a situation like that. Um, tenants that are breaking leases, don't allow a tenant to replace themselves. Remember, you interview your tenants for character and make sure they're you know, a good fit for your home. Um, don't allow someone else to, uh, you know, don't allow someone else to put a tenant in your house. So um, if the client leaves early or if they want to break the lease, um, first of all, you can treat the lease to be in full force. So you can tell the client they have to pay out the remainder of the lease. Uh, but I also think there's a middle ground uh, that you can that you can do. So usually what I'll do is if the client leaves early, um, they'll be re I make them to be responsible for any and all vacancy that it creates, uh, plus any expenses that I might incur to to to, to remarket the property. Um, so once it's been leased again, then I'll relieve the, the prior client or the prior tenant of, of all their, you know, obligations, financial obligations. Generally, what I end up doing is they pay for any vacancy, plus they lose their deposit. And that deposit is the payment for me having to remarket the property, give my time to go get somebody else in. Um, but I won't, you know, in that case, I, I don't have to. Uh, you know, if they break a six month lease or if they break six months early out of their lease, I'm not charging them, you know, 18 to $20,000. I can, I can be a little bit more reasonable and say, Hey, um, you can just pay for whatever vacancy and, and give up your deposit. Okay. But do not allow them to find you a new tenant and don't allow subletting. All right. So when a, a tenant vacates the property, um, the, the property should be the same as when they moved in, right? There's obviously there's some normal wear and, wear and tear, uh, but it should be professionally cleaned. If you professionally cleaned it before they moved in, it should be professionally cleaned when they move out. Okay, so they're always doing that. They should be cleaning the carpets, okay? If the carpets were professionally cleaned when they moved in, they should be professionally clean when they moved out. Make sure they return all your keys, your garage door openers, okay? And make sure all this stuff is stated in the lease um, and, and document any work that needs to be done and save receipts, okay? So... Um, pretty basic there. Tracking expenses, um, creating a ledger. Uh, it's really important. Um, you know, I always tell people don't give the IRS a reason to open your file. So you should have an organized system to track your rent payments and your expenses for the property. Um, so the, when you close on the property, when you purchase the property, you're going to get a settlement statement from the title company and the expenses on those on that sheet. A lot of those expenses are deductible. So make sure that you provide that to your CPA when you file your taxes. And then I would get some type of good bookkeeping software like uh, QuickBooks or Quicken. Um, there's a free one online called Wave Apps. Um, and you can use it as a ledger and it's com it's completely free and it gets the you know, it helps you categorize your expenses. And at the end of the year, you can just print off a P&L hand it to your CPA and you're done. Um, you can even upload receipts to it, that type of stuff. But if you have a high level of organization and, and you can take advantage of all the great tax incentives of owning real estate um, and your CPA will be happy and the IRS will be happy. They probably won't audit you if you have these things uh, in order properly, right? All right. Um, one of the questions I get asked a lot and we actually may do a full podcast on this is whether or not you should put your property into an LLC. Um, it, there's, there's, a couple schools of thought here, but, you know, I think you should, first of all, you should just consult a tax attorney or a real estate attorney uh, to figure out which option is best for you. Some of the reasons that people put their properties in LLCs are they kind of, they reduce the risk of liability a little bit. They separate and protect their assets. And then there may be some tax benefits depending on how they file their taxes. But uh, an LLC for the most part on a property is more of like a veil of ignorance than anything. It's like if someone went and searched your name, they they wouldn't see that you own 10 properties. You're much more likely to get sued if, you know, somebody knows you got a bunch of assets than um, if they look you up and they can't find anything, right? So um, a good attorney is going to be able to find anything that you have, but, you know, the layman person looking for looking for somebody rich to sue, they're probably not going to find it if it's an LLC. So, um, you know, if you if you want to put your property in an LLC, it's really easy to do yourself. Um, you can just go to the Secretary of State website and you can create a unique uh, LLC. Um, and then, you know, there's an upfront cost and then uh, there's a once a year, like $10 a year fee to have it in an LLC. And then once you complete that, we can help you get set up with a title company to do a quick claim uh, into that LLC. Uh, again, there are some potential ramifications on your loan, things like that. So definitely can you know consult with somebody before you do this and then once it's filed uh with the county the property will go in the llc name um protecting your assets so insure your assets um especially as your real estate portfolio grows 
Um, not only should you be insuring your each individual properties, but you should really start to think about like an umbrella insurance policy. Um, the umbrella insurance is an extra insurance that provides protection beyond the existing limits and coverages of your other policies. Um, and it's especially for like personal liability. So injuries and property damage, certain lawsuits, um, they're all going to be covered under an umbrella policy. Um, and they generally have requirements for your sub policies. So for your home, auto, rental, they're going to have you, there's going to be a standard limit that you have to have on those policies. So talk to an insurance agent. Um, insurance is your best friend as you start to, as you start to grow a, a portfolio, make sure you have good, uh, insurance coverage on your homes, um, and that you have a good, uh, umbrella policy. So talk with a, you know, local insurance agents. We've, we've got great referrals if you, if you need them, right? Um, tax benefits and write-offs. So we've talked many times about the tax benefits in your tax shelter. Um, so we give you a little list here of all the things that can be used to offset your rental income. Um, so when you're, you know, making a couple thousand dollars a month in rental income, how are you going to offset that? We've already talked about things like depreciation, but the cost of your home warranty, service calls to contractors, labor costs, replacement parts for repairs, um, any money spent to improve or repair the property could go into your depreciable uh, uh, buckets. Um, mileage to and from the property. Keep track of how many times you're driving to and from the property. You can write off your mileage. Um, some closing costs, any points that you paid to decrease the mortgage rate, um, inspection costs from, from, from purchasing the home, your insurance, your real estate taxes, um, any private mortgage insurance. If you have PMI on the property, um, uh, secondary, you know, if you've got a HELOC on the property. So again, talk to your accountant, talk to your CPA about which, which of these things can be written off in a single year and which ones should be depreciated. But there's a ton of things that you can, you can do. And this is where the tax advantages come in. Okay. Um, next page, we talk about 1031 exchanges. Uh, we just did an episode on 1031 exchanges uh, not too long ago, so I won't go into depth on that, but um, taking all that uh, capital gain that you may have when you sell the property and deferring it, kicking the can down the road by investing into another piece of property. Okay. All right. So to wrap up here, um, really just kind of final thoughts. It, it, the, the biggest thing to remember is that rental real estate is a business. So you get into the business to make money, to build wealth, to grow your assets, to build a portfolio, to leave a legacy for your family, whatever it is, but it's to build long-term wealth. Your tenants are your employees. They pay your bills, right? So you treat them with dignity and respect and they will return that. Okay, so there are tons of horror stories. I've heard so many horror stories about tenant landlord relationships. Do not be one of those stories. Take care of your tenants like you would take care of your family. Okay, use the golden rule. Okay, uh, one of the things that I always tell my tenants, it's pretty simple. If I wouldn't let my family stay in this home, I won't let you stay in the home. Okay, so if the heat goes out in the middle of winter and it's freezing cold, I'll get them a hotel room or I'll go buy a bunch of you know, space heaters that they can use in the house until I can get the furnace fixed. If the AC goes out in the summer, same thing. I'll go buy them, you know, window units, or I will put them in a hotel until I can get the AC fixed. If I would not let my family stay there, I wouldn't do it either, right? So um, these tenants are living in your most valuable asset, and it will do you no good to have an upset tenant. So uh, don't risk a dollar to pick up a penny, okay? Don't hold back $50 of a security deposit if there's risk for an expensive fight, okay? Real estate is a business and not all businesses are profitable all of the time. Know when to cut your losses and move on, right? So it is not worth having a fight over $100 on a security deposit. It will take up way more time, effort, stress than it's ever worth, right? I, if I'm withholding a security deposit, I'm probably withholding the entire thing because it's so bad that I'm taking the entire thing. If they didn't clean, I'd probably say, hey, do you want me to hire a cleaner and pay it out of your security deposit? And most times they'll say, yeah, that's fine, right? Like they'll give me permission to do it. But if they go, no, we cleaned, am I going to hold back $200 for a security deposit? Probably not. I'm not going to have the battle with them, okay? So rental real estate is seriously one of the most lucrative endeavors that you can ever experience. Um, it takes time. It takes effort. It's incredibly worth it. And there are so many tools and resources out there to help you, including myself, our team, anybody that uh, that wants to be involved. So uh, please let us know how we can help. 
download this free resource guide from uh, from www.blackyetigroup.com under the resources tab. Uh, just put your information in there, and it'll send you uh, send you the free PDF version, and you can go through this uh, go through this with that and call us, uh, email us with any questions. So anyway, I hope this was uh, informational for you. I hope this gives you an idea of what to, things to think about, what things that you really need to focus on when you're when you're starting your, your rental business for yourself. Um, and uh, now it's start to, time to start looking for your, for your next great real estate investment so you can uh, start getting that passive income and go out and live big. So everybody, hope you have a great day. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Live Big Podcast. For even more real estate and investment resources, go to blackyetigroup.com slash resources and download Nick's complete guide to running your own rental properties. Tune back in next week for another episode. And until then, live big. Live Big does not provide investment, legal, or tax advice, and nothing herein should be construed as being financial, legal, tax, or other advice. Live Big does not represent that any securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. No investment or other decision should be made solely based on the contents or information found on the website or podcast. When making a decision about your investments, you should seek the advice of a professional financial advisor or qualified expert.